when some of you know the story, when I went away to college, um, one of the things I said to myself was, thank God I don't have to go to church anymore. <laughs> and in the middle of my freshman year of college, at, um, through the rather sly and prayerful request of a dear woman who had been praying fervently for me, though I didn't know that at the time, um, I went off on a Christian retreat and there, God, in essence, turned my world right side up. When I got back to college, I, I really didn't know which way was up. Because I'd come into college as one person, and then after this retreat, had come back to college as a very different person. And a part of what God was gracious to do at that point in my life was to send me uh, a man who ran a large Sunday school class at the local church that I was attending, who in essence became for me over the course of the four years of my time at college, a genuine mentor, both he and his wife. Uh, he ran a Bible study in his home that a lot of college students attended, but not only that, he took a personal interest in me. I wound up, he did some retreat speaking, though layman, and uh, I would go with him often to some of those places, to really see him in action, which meant teaching, preaching, laying hands on people and praying for them in rather supernatural ways. It was a new door that God had really opened up in my life. I was all ears. Over the course of about 12 to 15 years of my life, God sent me a succession of mentors until I was actually about 35. And at that point, my life began to shift. It was as if God was saying, okay, now it's your turn. These men were very different from each other. One was a farmer. One was a successful businessman. One was a bishop. One was a priest. They were personality <coughs> difference. Their giftedness were different. But each of them had something that in essence, I needed to receive to be able to become and to continue to become the leader that I knew that God was making me. I, I tell you, and I am, quite honestly, a lot of who I am precisely because of those five men, almost all of whom are dead now, and this was now decades ago. I say that, tell you that story because to give thanks today for the life of Silas and Timothy and who's the other guy? Titus, sorry. Are, they are raised up for us as people whom Paul mentored. Yesterday was the feast of the conversion of St. Paul and now right beside the next day is us giving thanks for these three much younger men whom God helped raise up into life and ministry. They didn't get their start with him. In fact, when Paul connected with Silas, as it says, in the book of Acts, he's already considered a prophet in his community. But the Lord really used Paul in each of their lives. And we know most of that by the letter to Timothy about how God spoke into his life in a way that shaped who he was as a leader. The assumption in the Bible is that we always are having different people who are both teaching us and who we also are teaching as well as people who are walking beside us. There's a kind of organic unity to how we function as people who are growing in discipleship that's clearly laid out by example in terms of the whole flow of the New Testament. And so in many ways, if there's a theme to today's lessons, it has to do with the assumption that Paul, who had this kind of ongoing relationship with these three men, would help us echo, well, who has mentored me in my Christian walk? Who am I reaching out to on the younger side to help bring them along? Who are the people whom I continue, consider companions in the faith with whom I am engaged in ministry? In other words, there's no assumption in the New Testament that somehow we're kind of doing this off on our own somewhere, but that rather we are a part of a flow that God is doing through a whole series of relationships that God is using both to shape us and God is using us to shape them. That's considered normal Christian life. 
Why is that so? Because the task is so high. If I know my own heart, which all of us do to some modest extent, and me, including me, I do continue to surprise myself both for good and ill from time to time, that I need the input of other people to continue to become who it is that God has called me to be. I can't do this on my own. Not if I'm going to reach the call of God that God has on my life. And the church cannot grow in the ways that we hope if there aren't these kinds of relationships that are in place and are functioning that allow us to, to accord a scripture that's not being used, that we all might re attain, as it says in Colossians, mature manhood, <coughs> the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the standard, which means we are always at one level or not becoming. If God has given the church to the world as a light to the nations, if, we, if God has made a covenant with us as his people and the world that we might be people to whom they go to see the very light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if God expects our church to be a place where prophets function, where miracles occur, where we walk together in unity in a way that shows the world the love and the forgiveness that we have received in Jesus, I need all the help I can get. And that's the standard, you see. The standard is not the best local Episcopal church you know. The standard really is a body of people expressing corporately the life of Jesus. That's the standard. And if that's the standard, that means I need to continue to become. I ain't done yet. And that's actually true for all of us. And so the call is to say, God, are there people that you want to put into my life, both to lead me, as well as people that you want to put in my life that I can serve? and help them because that is the assumption of how the body functions best which means how we function best that we as a church might be that light to the nations that others might also come to know the jesus that we love and serve amen, amen. amen.